welcome everyone to Landmark's uh, seminar. Uh, today it's uh, Property Law Nuts and Bolts Part 2, the sequel, Understanding Forfeiture. Uh, we're delighted to see so many of you joining us, uh, those of you here in person and also online. Uh, and we hope you'll find the presentations and discussion today useful. My name's uh, Simon Allison and uh, I'm chairing the session today. I'm delighted to be joined by my colleagues, um, uh, Evie Barden, Peter Sibley and Rebecca Sage, who are going to take us all through the uh, messy and uh, I suppose sometimes archaic world of forfeiture. Uh, just to introduce our uh, speakers today, uh, Evie Barden was called in 2014. Uh, she has a practice that spans property litigation and commercial chancery work and is particularly good at dealing with property cases involving company law and insolvency elements uh, and is helpfully on my floor so I can go and ask her questions about horrible insolvency issues. Uh, she's on the Attorney General's C panel. I asked Evie to give me a fun fact about her. Uh, she was far too modest but we're going to run with Evie as a superb singer and last year she sold out the Royal Albert Hall for three consecutive nights. <laughs> Peter Sibley joined Chambers as a tenant in October 2021. He's building a practice with a focus on property law, residential and commercial but has a particular interest in rating and insolvency work and he's regularly appearing in county court hearings and trials and for the FTT the company's court and uh, in insolvency matters and uh, he's a keen road cyclist part of the Watford Velo Sport Race team and in 2019 he won stage 13 of the Tour de France mm. and finally Rebecca who will be our first speaker this evening Rebecca joined Chambers in October on completion of her pupillage uh, where she was the property pupil and an excellent pupil she was too. Before coming to the bar she worked as a transactional property solicitor, a government lawyer and of particular relevance to, uh, to tonight she was a lawyer on the Law Commission where she worked on updates to uh, the Commission's termination of tenancies report. Uh, now she's a tenant and building practice across all our areas. Two fun facts for Rebecca. Firstly, uh, she breathes hamsters and gerbils in her spare time. And secondly, when she, was, uh, when she was younger, she used to play tennis with the Harry Potter star Emma Watson. Not all of those facts are true, but I assure you some of them are. <laughs> Rebecca, let me hand over to you first. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, and I should also say that Simon used to be my um, pupil supervisor, so um, all my mistakes are his. <laughs> so I am going to start off our whistle-stop tour of the law of forfeiture. As Simon has warned you, it's uh, complicated, it's archaic, and there are plenty of pitfalls. But hopefully this session will help you avoid most, if not all of them. So, starting off with what we will cover, what is forfeiture? Always uh, a good starting point after we've established that, and it's not an, as easy a question as you might hope. Um, we'll, I'll go on to the two methods of forfeiture being peaceable re-entry and forfeiture proceedings. Then the main grounds for forfeiture, breach of covenant and non-payment of rent, and I'll end with some of the restrictions which apply to forfeiture claims. So I am, to some extent, laying the groundwork for Evie and Peter, but I'd be quite wary about describing it as a firm foundation. I'd say it's probably more like the gnarled roots of an ancient tree. And I say that specifically because I found a picture of a tree. Here we go, a gnarled tree. So we've got this um, quote from the Law Commission. I had to bring them in fairly early. Describing the law of forfeiture, they said in their uh, consultation paper back in 2003, it is complex, it lacks coherence and it can lead to injustice. Well, those are probably three attributes that any area of law shouldn't have. And whilst that statement was made in 2003, as we've mentioned, the law of forfeiture is ancient. It developed slowly and I'd say it's fairly relevant now. So now we're all feeling suitably depressed let's consider what the law of forfeiture actually is. Now, there are quite a lot of um, judicial comments about forfeiture and how difficult slash unsatisfactory it is. But this one's fairly straightforward from Arden Jay, as she was at the time, the ultimate affirmation of the landlord's proprietary power, which sounds very grand, um, but, but really what it is, is a right for the landlord to terminate the tenancy. There's two factors, that 
that termination right arises before the end of the original term and it's due to the tenant's default. It's also referred to as a right of re-entry, which will make more sense, I hope, during the course of my presentation. So there are two key points at the outset. First, there must be a breach by the relevant tenant. And that breach could be of a covenant. I'm sure we're all familiar with covenants in leases, for example, not to sublet, um, not to carry out any alterations without consent, etc. There might also be a breach of condition, and that's a little bit more rare or difficult to work out, and I'll come on to that later. The third potential category of breach is a breach by denying the landlord's title, which is very archaic, very rare, and um, you'll be pleased to hear it's not something I'm going to talk about today. The second key point to think about at the beginning is that, as I said on the slide, the right to forfeit arises under the terms of the lease. So it's very important to look to the lease to work out whether the landlord is entitled to forfeit for the breach. And I'll talk about that in the coming slides also. Now, I've put on the slide um, in the last few bullet points a few other points that are relevant to what Evie and Peter are going to talk about. So firstly, it is a right. The landlord has to elect between forfeiting and treating the lease as continuing. And that is a fact which is very relevant to waiver of the right to forfeit. Now, once a landlord tries to forfeit a lease, a tenant or a subtenant or mortgagee can try and save the lease by applying for relief. And that's what Peter will discuss. And if that, that um, derivative interest holder is not um, able to save the lease, then both the lease and that derivative interest will terminate. And it's often said that the branch falls with the tree. So there we go, another ancient tree analogy for you. Um, and the final point to think about, which again I'll discuss, is that there are different rules depending on the way the landlord chooses to forfeit, the nature of the breach and the type of tenancy. So there's lots of different factors to consider. But as a starting point, there's no forfeiture without breach. So, as I've mentioned, two main forms of breach to think about. The first one, a breach of covenant. Um, so that broadly, as I'm sure you all know, is an agreement by the tenant to do or not to do certain things. Now, for breach of covenant, the landlord cannot forfeit unless the lease includes a specific provision allowing forfeiture. That's often referred to as a right of re-entry. I'll come on to discuss that. The other potential basis for breach is a breach of condition. And I put the words on the slide, uh, which might suggest that uh, an obligation in the lease is a condition. And uh, at common law, there's no need for a lease to contain a right of re-entry to forfeit for breach of condition. In reality, however, you'll be very pleased to hear that the distinction shouldn't matter because a well-drafted lease, and obviously why would we be looking at anything else, um, would contain this chap, a forfeiture clause slash a proviso for re-entry, because why would it only have one name? A few points to note, which I've put in bold on this slide. The first, important, the landlord may re-enter, i.e. forfeit. The second one is to do with the first limb of the forfeiture clause concerning non-payment of rent. And this sets out the landlord's right to forfeit if the tenant fails to pay rent. Now, you might think that rent is a fairly straightforward word in a lease, but when you're looking at a forfeiture clause, something that you need to bear in mind is the different things that might be reserved as rent under the lease. Now, usually in a commercial lease, at least, that would include service charges as well as the annual rent. So if the tenant fails to pay a service charge, then that could lead to forfeiture of the lease if... Um, if the other conditions aren't met. And we have here that it's a 14 day grace period. That's quite usual. It could be 14, probably up to 21 days. The next bit, whether it has been demanded or not, deals with a fairly, uh, again, ancient and archaic element of the common law that I'll briefly mention in a moment. The second limb, breach of any condition or tenant covenant in the lease. Aha, so it doesn't matter whether it is a condition or a tenant covenant. Uh, that is very useful. And then we've got the little proviso at the end, which includes 
the point that this lease will immediately end. And I will also come back to that because the ending of a lease on forfeiture is, believe it or not, not entirely straightforward. If your lease does not have a forfeiture clause, obviously you're back to considering whether the breach is of a covenant or a condition, and ideally that's a situation you don't really want to be in. So, assuming that you have established a breach and the right to forfeit arises under the lease, how might you go about forfeiting? So the first potential method is, again, something with two names, peaceable or physical re-entry. And we've got a fairly strong view from Lord Templeman in this case, a dubious and dangerous method. Well, dubious if you're a tenant, but probably dangerous if you're a landlord. It involves physically entering onto the property. So the, the most common way of doing that is by changing the locks. Um, but otherwise an unequivocal act to end the tenancy would be sufficient, so that might include granting a new tenancy. However, that it must be peaceable, hence peaceable re-entry. And regardless of the nature of the premises, a landlord commits a criminal offence if violence is used or threatened, um, whilst peaceable or physical re-entry is obtained. And if the premises are residential, well, I would say, in reality, peaceful re-entry doesn't apply to residential premises. And that is because of the combined effect of the Protection from Eviction Act 1977 and the Housing Act 1988, which puts a landlord who attempts to peaceably re-enter a residential property at risk of being convicted for a criminal offence and also being liable to the tenant in damages for unlawful eviction. So. In reality, this method, while it is theoretically quick and easy, isn't without its risks. And in reality, it would be used only for commercial premises. And because of the point about not being able to use um, violence, if it's used or threatened, it would generally be out of hours to ensure that no one's at the premises. More common is forfeiture by proceedings and proceedings are issued under CPR Part 55. They might be commenced in the county court or in the high court. The choice of court does have implications for relief, which Peter will discuss. Now, the important thing um, to think about is that commencement of proceedings means the lease is treated as forfeited. So the termination date of the lease speaks to the date on which proceedings are issued. However, um, of course, there will be a delay before the claim is heard. At the moment, it's probably going to be quite a significant delay. And who knows what could happen at that hearing? It may well be that the court considers the landlord is not entitled to forfeit. So until there is a court judgment, the lease has not, in fact, ended. And so there's what's called a twilight period. Um, I think that might actually be a sunrise. I'm not entirely sure. Anyway, um, let's pretend it's twilight. <laughs> a twilight period. And that so-called twilight period applies between the issue of proceedings and the determination of the landlord's claim. And so this is the slightly odd element I referred to in relation to the forfeiture clause, where it says that the, the lease comes to an end immediately. Well, that's not quite the end of the story. And during this twilight period, a landlord needs to be very careful because it's in effect taken to treat the tenant as a trespasser. So it shouldn't be going around asking for rent. Um, in reality, the tenant isn't required to pay rent at all. It's liable to pay mean profits, which conveniently are generally calculated as being exactly the same as the rent. And um, importantly, the landlord can't enforce covenants because obviously the lease is terminated, except it hasn't, but we're pretending it has. So obviously that makes a huge amount of sense. And then if the landlord's claim does fail or the tenant or a mortgagee obtains relief, then the lease is reinstated retrospectively. Um, so again, it, it sort of revives the lease back to that date when the proceedings were issued. Now, it, it sounds complicated, and to be frank, it, it is, and it's probably more complicated than it needs to be, but it is the most um, well-used form of forfeiture. So it's worth thinking about how you go about uh, forfeiting by proceedings. Obviously, there isn't just one rule for all types of forfeiture claims because that would be far too simple. 
there are two and the rules differ depending on whether the landlord is forfeiting for non-payment of rent or breach of any other covenant or condition. For breach of another covenant or condition, our friend section 146 of the Law of Property Act 1925 comes into play and I've put that up on the slide. Again, I've highlighted some points to think about. The first one being the need to serve a notice and that notice needs to be served on the tenant. Now, if uh, forfeiture is being used in relation to residential premises, then there is a practice direction, practice direction 55A, which requires the landlord to state the name and um, address of anyone entitled to relief in the particulars and they will then be served. But otherwise, there's no requirement to serve under lessees or mortgagees. The notice must then specify the particular breach complained of. Now, that is very important. For example, if the tenant has sublet illegally, then it's not enough for the landlord to specify, say, clause nine of the lease, which refers to assignment, subletting and parting with possession. The landlord has to specifically say you have sublet in breach of this clause. Then two points which I will go on to consider. Whether the breach is capable of remedy is a question the landlord has to ask itself. And if it is capable of remedy, then the tenant has to be required to remedy it. The tenant also has to be given a reasonable time to do so. Um, so obviously it's not just a case of serving a standard form of notice on the tenant and hoping for the best. There does have to be some thought, analysis and legal advice before any of that happens. Uh, I guess we're all happy about that. I should say though, that even apart from section 146 of the Law of Property Act, it's still very important to check the lease because some leases have further requirements um, beyond that which is set out in section 146. Some leases, for example, will have a default notice provision that allows a tenant to in effect have advance notice before a section 146 notice is served. And if a landlord hasn't complied with requirements like that, then it's not entitled to serve a section 146 notice because technically the right to forfeit under the lease has not yet arisen. So again, another pitfall to be aware of. So as advertised, remediable and irremediable breaches. Um, now another stock photo, you might pick up that I'm quite the fan um, of this building, which looks lovely. I mean, maybe let's say it's a glamorous office, lovely shutters on the outside, but um, it also appears to be on fire. So something has clearly gone wrong. Um, and I'll come back to the scenario in the picture, but first it's good to think about the nature of remediable and irremediable breaches. Now, at law, there's only one kind of breach currently that is irremediable. And that's a breach of a covenant not to assign or sublet without consent. The reasoning for that is that an unlawful lease or assignment can't be undone. And that comes from the case I've got on the slide there, which is uh, from 1974. Now, relatively recently, and I mean 2005, so recently in forfeiture um, terms, Lord Justice Newberger um, thought that there would be a potential for the Supreme Court to take a different view if the matter came before it, because he thought that a surrender or an assignment back to the original tenant would be perfectly sufficient to remedy that breach. And I have to say that does seem sensible, uh, but obviously because it's sensible and because the law of forfeiture moves so slowly, that hasn't come up yet. So watch this space on irremediable breaches. I've also got on the slide potentially illegal slash immoral user, as that's often listed in textbooks as another example of a use which is irremediable. And the reasoning in that case is that once the premises are tainted by use as e.g. a brothel, um, that taint doesn't go away. But again, thinking about the specific facts of a case, it could well be that that irremediable, potentially irremediable legal user was carried out by an illegal subtenant. And if the tenant in question can get rid of that subtenant and um, stop using the premises in that way, could, could it be that that potentially irremediable breach actually is remediable. And that really brings me on to the key issue slash 
legal fun arena um, in terms of these breaches, which is that it's really a question of fact, whether a breach is remediable or not. Um, the courts will interpret it in a very practical way, not a technical way. So with our practical and not technical hats on, having a look at this picture again, um, I'll take a couple of examples I've got on the slide, positive and negative covenants. So a positive covenant, imagine the tenant in this case is under an obligation to insure. Now, if the premises weren't on fire, you could see how that breach could be remedied fairly easily by the tenant putting in place an insurance policy. But um, unfortunately, because they are on fire, uh, in my view, it'd be quite difficult to remedy that breach. The damage has been done and the effect of failure to obtain an insurance policy has already arisen. And then a negative covenant. Let's assume that there was a covenant not to make any alterations to the outside of the building and the tenant installed these lovely looking shutters. Well, the question there is, could the breach be undone? Well, yes. The tenant could remove the shutters. You can see the third floor on that picture doesn't seem to have any, or they're a bit different. Um, so it'd be perfectly possible for the tenant to remedy that breach by taking off the shutters. So you can see there that it's very much a question of fact. There could have been a separate um, alteration to the outside of the building that couldn't be undone so easily. For example, some of this um, decorative sort of detailing if the tenants put that on and it can't easily be removed then maybe the breach isn't in fact remediable and then the final element that i'll consider in relation to a section 146 notice concerns the time for compliance with the notice now this again is always a question of fact and i've put some examples from case law up on the slide the difficulty in taking anything from these cases really is that they all turn on their facts. So for example, this repair case, Cardigan Properties, um, the tenant, it was reasonable for the tenant to have up to a year to remedy the breach in that case, which um, related to repair. But the property was so dilapidated over so many years and been occupied by squatters, etc., that you can just imagine what state it was in by the end. Um, and it may well be that a lesser degree of repair attracts a much shorter period. Again, it's all about the facts and um, luckily or unluckily for us, lawyers will be very important in the landlord's decision as to how long to give a tenant. The final bullet point on that slide is important to remember, which is that even if the tenant can't remedy the breach, the landlord does need to give sufficient notice to enable the tenant to consider its position. We've got their cases between two and 14 days Again, it, it will depend on the nature of the breach in that case. Ah, you, you might have thought I'd forgotten the other element of uh, forfeiture, non-payment of rent. And um, you might remember way back about 10 minutes ago when I spoke about the um, forfeiture clause saying that rent could um, was payable whether demanded or not. And that is because of this. Uh, rule from a case from 1669. I'm not going to pretend that's modern even by forfeiture standards. And the quote on the slide is in effect the common law test for a demand of rent. You can see it's A, unclear and B, quite um, difficult to comply with depending on when sunset might fall on any given day or any given time of the year. You know, it's great at the moment in a way because it's in the middle of the working day. But if you're near midsummer, then you've got a partner from a law firm uh, heading across to demand rent at a ridiculous time of day. Luckily, uh, statute has intervened. I've put the relevant references up on the slide. And even if there isn't a forfeiture clause in the terms I discussed earlier, you don't need to formally demand rent if half a year's rent is in arrear and CRA is not available to recover the arrears or there are insufficient goods on the premises. I'm sure you all are aware what commercial rent arrears recovery is, but broadly it replaced the law of distress and it allows the landlord to uh, seize and sell goods of the tenant to satisfy rent arrears. So all of this is a very good reason why the, the forfeiture clause will stipulate that rent is due, whether formally demanded or not. Happily, forfeiture for non-payment of rent, you don't need to worry about serving a section 146 notice. But again, don't forget practice direction 55A in terms of um, noting the, those who are entitled to relief on the claim form.
finally, you am pleased here. As if there weren't enough restrictions on forfeiture, there are even more, and this is a selection in the statute. I've mentioned during my talk that the application of forfeiture to residential leases might be limited. And in reality, I think it's easiest to conceptualise forfeiture as applying only in the commercial sphere or perhaps only straightforwardly in the commercial sphere. Certainly any short leases such as a short tenancies have their own separate termination regime under the Housing Act. But if you do have a long lease of a dwelling, which is capable of being forfeited, there are certain restrictions. So the top one on the slide, the 2002 Act, uh, prevents forfeiture um, for unpaid rent or service charges unless they are above a certain level, which is currently set at £350, or has been unpaid for a certain period, which is currently three years, or prevents forfeiture for a breach of a covenant or condition until that breach has been admitted by the tenant or finally determined by a court or tribunal. And the Housing Act 1966, which is the second bullet point, uh, includes a broadly similar provision saying that there's no forfeiture of leases to which it applies unless the amount of any service or administration charge has been admitted or finally determined. And then finally, um, a point that's relevant to both commercial and residential leases is a breach of repair covenant. Any landlord who is forfeiting for breach of repair must in the section 146 notice inform the tenant of a right to serve a counter notice under the 1938 Act, uh, which is a whole complicated procedure of its own, which I won't go into for the purposes of today's talk. And that is a whistle-stop tour of the law of forfeiture. So Evie will now guide you further into the murky depths. Thank you, Rebecca. I'm going to talk about um, waiving the right to forfeit. So as Rebecca explained, once the right to forfeit has arisen, you as landlord stand at a crossroads. The breach of a covenant or another event giving rise to the right to forfeit gives the landlord um, the right to make an election. There's a choice, which is between enforcing the right to forfeit and treating the lease as being at an end, or not enforcing the right to forfeit and treat the lease as continuing to exist. A waiver is where the landlord chooses to treat the lease as continuing uh, to exist. It's key to note that there is a distinction between waiving the right to forfeit, which is based on the landlord's election of the right to forfeit for a breach. Um, in the, that circumstance, the right to damages for the breach remains intact. And the other situation, which is waiving the breach of covenant based on the inference of the landlord's consent to the breach. That bars all of the landlord's remedies for the breach. Um, neither waiver, however, bars the landlord's remedies in respect of subsequent breaches. Um, waiver of the right to forfeit, critically, does not equal waiver of the covenant, um, absent contrary intention. You get that from section 148 of the Law of Property Act 1925. And critically, and the, and the reason that this is all important, is an election once made cannot be retracted. So you've made your decision to waive the breach. Um, you cannot turn back. So you're at your crossroads. You're either going left or right, and you're not turning back. So what is the recipe for waiver? Firstly, the landlord has to have full knowledge of the facts upon which the right to re-enter re arises. Then the landlord must also do some unequivocal act recognising the continued existence of the lease. And lastly, that act has to be communicated to the tenant. Once all of those three things are together, then you have a waiver. So let's turn to the first one, knowledge. Um, knowledge must be of the basic facts which in law amount to the breach of covenant. Um, and knowledge can be imputed. So knowledge um, of an agent um, 
an employee can be um, attributed to the landlord. That's really a question of the law of agency rather than the law of forfeiture or, or landlord and tenant. Um, generally, it will be imputed where it was part of the duty of the employee to report the matter in question to the landlord. So, for example, there's a case in which the knowledge of a porter in a block of flats had uh, was aware that there was subletting that had taken place and that was imputed to a landlord. Um, but it all, as I said earlier, it, it all turns on the agent's authority. If the agent has no duty to report the breach, then the knowledge generally won't be imputed. Um, what about information that's in the public domain? Um, I've put on the slide the case of the official custodian for charities and Parway Estates Development Limited. Um, in, in that case, the court considered whether an ad in the London Gazette um, was notice of um, the event that had happened being the tenant being an insolvency to the world for the purposes of a landlord having knowledge uh, in order to be able to waive the right to forfeit um, after the tenant had gone into liquidation. What the court said in that case was that uh, the fact that there was an ad in the Gazette did not impute knowledge to anyone. The object of the legislation in that case is for people dealing with the company uh, to be able to have the opportunity to find out whether there's any information concerning the um, company, but in no sense hampering the company vis-a-vis -vis those who have actual knowledge of the real event. If you can make any sense of that at all, I would be grateful. Um, what about suspicions. Um, so say, for example, a landlord suspects that a subletting is going on, but is told by the tenant there is no subletting. Would that constitute knowledge? Probably not in that situation. But if the landlord has reasonable grounds for suspicion um, of a breach of covenant and takes no steps to establish the truth or falsity of that suspicion, then there may be sufficient knowledge. You, you might be in hot water in that situation, basically. Um, for that, it would be it would be helpful to look at Van Harlem and Kasner. Um, in that case, there was a lease of 99 years to Mr. Van Harlem, which contained a provision for re-entry if there was any unpaid rent for 21 days or any breach of any covenants. Uh, in April 1988, Mr. Van Harlen was arrested and charged with offences under the Official Secrets Act. He was then later found guilty of spying by using the flat for that purpose. Um, all of the matters that he was found guilty of would have given rise to the uh, given rise to forfeit for a breach of the covenant not to use the flat for illegal activities. Um, there was then an attempt to forfeit the lease. Um, for breach of that covenant. And the question was whether um, the landlord knew of any of the charges um, and demands made after April 1988 constituted waivers. Um, the landlord had not taken any steps to investigate the facts and the court said that it was distinct from a case where a landlord had mere suspicion faced with a clear explanation to the contrary uh, by denial from the tenant. This was one, a case where there was a great deal of publicity and communications with the tenant. So there was more than mere suspicion of the illegal use of the flat. Of the flat. Basically, it's really fact specific, but a landlord who has some suspicion should probably do some digging um, because they might be, they might have waived the breach if they do things, which we'll come on to in a minute, which could constitute acts recognizing the continued existence of the tenancy. Critically, the question of knowledge, um, the burden of proving that is on the tenant. Um, so if you're the tenant, you've you've got to do the running on this point. What, um, what then next, going on to the second limb of the recipe for waiver, uh, the act that the landlord does must be so unequivocal that when considered objectively, it could only be regarded as having been done consistently with the continued existence of the tenancy. That uh, comes from, well, the most recent restatement of it comes from Stemp and Six Ladbroke Gardens Management Limited. Um, 
the act of waiver basically has to be a, a positive act recognizing the continued existence of the tenancy. So merely lying by and witnessing a breach doesn't equal a waiver. Um, but be careful where you have long continued acquiescence in repeated breaches of covenant, because that may well um, amount to a waiver. It, basically, in, in any given case, you have to look at the act relied upon to see whether it amounts to an act so unequivocal that considered objectively, it could only be consistent with the lease continuing. Um, it, basically, it's all very fact specific, like uh, Rebecca said, um, but I'm going to consider a few specific examples in the next few, few slides. So the classic place where this trips people up is demands for and acceptance of rent. Um, Fires and Burnley, a case of, in the Court of Appeal in 2021, is a good case to look at if you're considering this issue. And the main points to take away from that case is, firstly, the landlord will waive the right to forfeit by demanding or accepting rent, which accrued due after the date of a breach of covenant known to the landlord. The critical question, therefore, is whether the rent falls due bef before or after the breach, not whether it accrued due before or after the landlord knew. So, for example, where the breach equals unlawful subletting, the landlord would have to know not only that the subletting had taken place, but also that the rent demanded or accepted fell due after the date of the breach of covenant. What about a case where the landlord accepts part payment of rent, um, which is uh, unpaid for the period required in the lease? Is that a waiver? Uh, it's not rent falling due after the breach because the breach equals non-payment. I, I think that's quite a difficult case. I had that recently and the authorities on that seem to go both ways. Critically, it won't help to accept any rent on a WP basis because it's the question is about election. You, you can't accept rent without prejudice to your rights. You're making a choice by doing that. Um, also note, demand or receipt of rent after re-entry doesn't equal a waiver because by re-entering, the landlord has already elected to determine the lease. So you've already made your, your decision at the crossroads and you're not turning back. The second kind of example to think about is CRA. As um, Rebecca mentioned earlier, the commercial rent arrears recovery is the new regime for distress effectively. And normally it can only be used while the lease continues. Um, it's a self-help remedy and uh, it is for commercial premises only. Um, generally, well, not generally, the use of CRA will recognise the continuance of the lease and equal a, a waiver. And you get that from the case of, of BRA, a 2019 Court of Appeal case. Um, it was argued in BRA that CRA, unhelpfully, these two names are so similar, uh, is a neutral act because it can be exercisable for up to six months after the end of the lease. But the Court of Appeal rejected that argument. Um, CRA is not exercisable after a forfeiture and it can only be exercised by a lessor. Thus, CRA in principle amounts to an unequivocal act confirming the lessor's decision to affirm the continuance of the lease, i.e. it will waive the right to forfeit. So what about when you have issued a claim or you're issuing a claim? Um, the short point is be really careful about what claims you plead. Um, there are a number of cases in which the way in which the claim was pleaded constituted a waiver. So the first claim on the slide, a claim for an injunction and possession, um, but a statement that the landlord was willing to grant a lease equaled a waiver. Similarly, claims for injunctions against breaches of covenant, uh, breaches of covenant equal waivers. And you, you can understand why that's the case. You're relying on the terms of the lease for the purposes of the relief that you're seeking before the court. What about um, a claim for the production of an insurance policy uh, under the required under the tenant's insurance covenant? Again, that will amount to a waiver. Last, a claim for rent will be a waiver, but that is unless it is coupled with a claim for possession. So 
if you are bringing a claim for possession based on your entitlement to forfeit, as Rebecca said, the most common way to um, bring about the end of the lease uh, in a forfeiture claim, um, you are able to seek the arrears of rent in the same claim. Um, but you would be in difficulty if, for example, you brought a debt claim, a freestanding claim, and you didn't have a claim for possession. Um, basically, if the relief that you're seeking is subsidiary or incidental to the claim for possession, then you'll be okay. You've unequivocally elected to determine um, where the relief is not subsidiary or incidental to the claim for possession, then the right is going to be lost. There is um, a slightly curious case then that arose in Calabar Properties and Seagull Autos, where you have a claim for possession and an injunction in the alternative. Is that sufficiently unequivocal to constitute a waiver? Well, the court in that case said it was fine because the injunction could be abandoned before trial. So probably okay in that situation. But it, you know, it is really um, important to think about this when pleading and to carefully uh, select the relief that you've got in your claim. Then next, on to the last element of the recipe for relief, communication. The reason that this all matters is the waiver of the right to re-entry can only occur when the act is communicated to the tenant. If the act or statement is never communicated, it won't be operative as, as an election. You could you could change your mind. Um, so, for example, the assignee of the reversion to a lease who took a conveyance subject to and with the benefit of a lease and with knowledge of a breach of covenant um, that would entitle the landlord to re-enter didn't waive the right because the conveyance isn't a communication to the tenant. It's a, it's to the assignee. Um, if the waiver is in a document, for example, a demand sent to the tenant and the uh, document is not received, then the uh, waiver is not effective or effective until it is received. Um, that comes from the case of David Blackstone and Burnett's West End. Um, Can you contract out of a waiver? Sometimes you see clauses like the ones on the slide. No act of waiver will debar a forfeiture or any act of waiver will not be effective unless it is in writing. And the short answer is in, in English, no, no, you can't contract out. The foundation, as I've said repeatedly, is the doctrine of election. So clauses like this are ineffective. Um, but watch this space perhaps because such clauses have held to be effective in the courts in Australia and New Zealand. So maybe this is the time for us to be trying something novel here. I don't know that I would fancy it though. <laughs> um, what is the effect of an election? So you've got two different kinds of, um, two different routes um, for what happens once you've made once you've waived the breach. And it's important to distinguish between those two different routes. On the one hand, you have once and for all breaches. And on the other hand, you have continuing breaches. Once and for all breaches are things like non-payment of rent, assignment or subletting, a failure to carry out works or repairs by a specified date or alterations. It is a covenant that requires an act to be performed with a within a definite time and it is broken once and for all if it is not performed within that time. For those breaches, you waive it, you lose it. Um, it is waived forever. That does not preclude you being able to forfeit for subsequent breaches, but for that non-payment of rent, you cannot revive your right to waive, uh, your right to forfeit. Where um, the covenant, the once and for all covenant is bound up with another covenant, which has also been broken, and you know you might characterize that one as a continuing breach, you waive one and you waive both. So for example, if there is a clause which says no subletting of parts, and you could also, and also only use the premises as a private dwelling, a subletting of part as commercial use will waive both parts of that, even though the breach of user covenant is continuing. Continuing breaches, on the other hand, uh, save in exceptional circumstances where there has been a license to commit the breach, 
um, will not, uh, the waiver of that breach won't preclude you from forfeiting um, on the subsequent day because that can, that breach occurs every single day. So for example, a failure to keep in repair, a failure to ensure uh, a user covenant is an example of a continuing breach. Last, what about statutory bars on forfeiture and waiver? Rebecca touched on these earlier, and I'm not going to go into the statutory bars again, um, but it's important to think about how this interacts with the uh, with the right to make an election. And the case to look at again on this is the case of STEMP, which is an FTT decision from 2019. Um, what had happened was there was a long lease of a dwelling and as Rebecca said earlier the landlord has to either get a determination or it has to be admitted the breach in order for the landlord to be able to exercise its right to forfeit under section 168 of the common hold and leasehold reform act 2002 and um, what was said in STEMP, STEMP was that until that has occurred, until there has been a determination, the landlord is not in a position to forfeit. Um, so um, the landlord can, um, the landlord argued until there was a determination, it wasn't possible for it to waive the breach. The FTT rejected that argument and said that while the determination was pending, the landlord could still waive the breach. And you can see why that can be really problematic for a landlord, because it can take a very long time for proceedings for determination to conclude um, before the landlord is in a position to then be able to forfeit. And in that interim period, the landlord can't do anything which re recognises the continuing existence of the lease. For example, making demands or accepting rent or service charges. There were a few examples of what what could or couldn't constitute waiver in STEMP. Um, demands and, and acceptance of rent and service charges were clearly on the wrong side of it. So even though there hadn't been a determination, those would amount to waivers. Another sort of situation that was discussed was communications with the leaseholders, um, i.e. letters sent to people described as the leaseholders. And that wasn't um, wasn't held to be a, a waiver because it wasn't sufficiently unequivocal. Um, then the last category of things which were discussed was section 20 consultations for major works, which is obviously going to be of um, significant concern to a landlord in the position um, in the STEMP case. And that seems like it would be OK, given what is said in STEMP at paragraph 82, that the landlord had no other option but to include the relevant leaseholders in the consultation. Um, seems to me like something that landlords ought to be a bit concerned about notwithstanding the decision in STEM, STEM being a first instance instance decision because that is to my mind quite an unprincipled decision um, given that a section 20 consultation requires con ex uh, continuing to acknowledge the existence of the lease and the principled basis behind waiver is that you're uh, making a decision between recognising the lease or not recognising the lease. So I think that might be something which might be revisited in future cases. Um, so watch that space carefully. Last, before handing over to Peter, um, I'm going to invite you to do a quiz with me, which is going to be called Wave or No Wave. If you're, um, wh whether you're at home or online, I would invite you now to log into the website at the bottom of the page, polyv.com com forward slash landmark c980 okay right so this is basically a test of whether i'm capable of teaching any of you anything and the question is for each of these has it been a waiver or not a waiver okay the no waiver is, is steadily increasing, right up, up to 8%. Although, seems like the people's choice is that, oh, maybe not. Um, um, oh, wow, we are, we are going up and up and up for the no waiver. This, unfortunately, to all those no waiver fans is, is a waiver because the offer to buy the interest can't be made. 
except for on the basis that the lease is continuing. Um, there's a case that says this, a 1968 case called Bader Properties and Linley Property Investments. So um, question one, waiver. On to question two, landlord relying on a covenant to enter demise premises. This is pretty a bit more even, but we're looking like a, there's a clear, clear waiver. The sort of situation I'm imagining is there's a right to enter to see the state of condition or the repairs, if that changes your mind at all. Okay, well, this, I, I, I mean, from a principal perspective, I would agree with all of you who have said waiver, but Unfortunately, Stemp says that we're wrong and that this won't be a waiver if the landlord has proclaimed that it is proceeding towards a forfeiture of a lease for an identified breach and where in the meantime the landlord performs its responsibilities regarding the building. At paragraph 83 of that judgment, I do not consider that reliance by the landlord upon the terms of the lease for the purposes of performing these responsibilities amounts to an action so unequivocal that when considered objectively, it could only be regarded as being consistent with the lease continuing. So this might be one which depends on the facts, but watch out carefully. Question three. What about where the landlord allows the tenant to spend money on works to the demise premises? Quickly, everyone shot to waiver, but we are getting, the no waiver is gaining some traction. Um, this is probably a waiver because it, it's probably evidence of consent to alterations and continuance of the term. What about where the landlord engages in without prejudice discussions with the land, with the tenant? Oh, we're going swinging violently. Um, probably no waiver. Um, so those who voted for the seventy six percent who voted uh, voted no waiver are are likely correct here. And lastly, but not least acceptance of rent due pending a notice to repair, which is not then complied with. There is a, a last minute rush for the no waivers. I'm not, we might be 50-50, we might, we might have, well, on this occasion, the no waivers have it. Because until, if you've got a date for compliance with the notice to repair, the breach doesn't occur until that date has arisen. So acceptance of rent due pending the, the date is, is going to be fine. Or after, the, after the date has passed, you'll be in, in a different position, but up, up to the date given in the notice, that's not going to be a waiver. And we'll leave it there and hand over to Peter to tell you more about relief. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm tasked with speaking to you for the next 20 minutes or so about relief from forfeiture. Now, relief from forfeiture is, as I'm sure you're aware, a principle which applies beyond the bounds of landlord and tenant law, but I will be confining my talk this evening to the application of the principle in that context. What is relief from forfeiture? Where granted, the lease will revive and continue as if it had never been determined. In Dendy and Evans, referred to on my slide, the court stated that where relief is granted, the lease is treated as never having been forfeited at all. The guiding principle for relief from forfeiture is stated in Shiloh Spinners, Spinners Limited and Harding, where it was said that the right of the Relief from forfeiture is the right of courts of equity in appropriate and limited cases to relieve against forfeiture for a breach of covenant or condition where the primary object of the bargain is to secure a stated result which can effectively be attained where the matter comes before the court and where the forfeiture provision is added by way of security for the production of that result. So I think the key point there is where the forfeiture provision is added by way of security for, for a stated result 
With a few exceptions, the law on relief from forfeiture is split between the law relating to relief from forfeiture in non-payment of rent cases and the law relating to relief from forfeiture in other breaches um, or other breach cases, so not non-payment of rent cases. To take the uh, latter first, the law relating to other breaches of covenant, so not rent arrears cases, the principal jurisdiction here is section 146 of the Law of Property Act 1925, and it's subsection 2 that we are concerned with here. I put it on the slide. Um, there is a lot in the section, so I think it, it's helpful to read it out. So, where a lessor is proceeding by action or otherwise to enforce such a right of re-entry or forfeiture, the lessee may, in the lessor's action, if any, or in any action brought by himself, apply to the court for relief. And the court may grant or refuse relief as the court, having regard to the proceedings and conduct of the parties under the foregoing provisions of this section and to all the other circumstances, thinks fit. And in the case of relief, may grant it on such terms, if any, as to costs, expenses, damages, compensation, penalty or otherwise, including the granting of an injunction to restrain any like breach in the future, as the court in the circumstances of each case thinks fit. So there is quite a lot packed into subsection 2 of section 146, um, but to highlight a few points. The first is with reference to Packwood Transport and Beauchamp Place, where it was held uh, in the Court of Appeal, that proceeding, which is a word that features um, in section 146.2, includes the service of a section 146 notice. So as soon as a section 146 notice is served, a tenant can apply for relief from forfeiture in these section 146 type cases. At the other end of the timeline, however, the court in Bilson and Residential Apartments held that once a landlord has executed a judgment for possession, the right to apply for relief from forfeiture is lost. So it's lost where a landlord has executed um, and enforced their judgment for possession, but that is not the case where the landlord re-enters and recovers possession by peaceable re-entry. By way of an aside, when I was reading this case, and to pick up on a point made by Rebecca about the dangers of peaceable re-entry as a method of exercising forfeiture, the, court, uh, the House of Lords in Bilson referred to the fact that the landlords or their advisers, perhaps incensed by the activities of the tenants in the present case, conceived and carried out a dawn raid, which fortunately did not result in bloodshed. So there's a useful practical tip there, that as long as there's no bloodshed, your peaceable re-entry should be okay. But going back to section 146.2, the tenant can bring an action, um, their own action for relief from forfeiture, or seek it as a counterclaim in the landlord's action. How then does the court exercise its discretion on relief under section 146.2? The first case I have on my slide is the decision of the Court of Appeal in Magnic uh, Limited. Uh, that decision where at paragraph 50 the court summarised quite neatly the principles guiding the court's discretion. The court said at paragraph 50, the starting point for the exercise of our discretion has to be to remind ourselves that the purpose of the reservation of a right of re-entry in the event of unpaid rent or a breach of covenant is to provide the landlord with some security for the performance of the tenant's covenants. The risk of forfeiture is not intended to operate as an additional penalty for breach. It is an ultimate sanction designed to protect the landlord's reversion from continuing breaches of covenant which remain unremedied and to secure performance of the covenants. There may of course be breaches which are so serious and irremediable as to justify the refusal of relief, but in most cases relief will be granted on the breach being remedied and on terms as to costs. So that's I think the key uh, at the end there. In most cases the relief will be granted on the breach being remedied and on terms as to costs. This point is um, echoed, clarified, um, said in a different way in Freifeld and West Kensington Court Limited, where the court said the discretion to grant relief is very wide and is not to be subjected to rigid rules. So the court has a wide discretion and it will exercise that based on the particular circumstances of the case before it. The court will look at things like 
whether the tenant's breach was law, uh, willful or deliberate, inadvertent or by mistake, caused by circumstances beyond the tenant's control, whether the tenant has sought to make good the breach and its willingness to do so in the future, whether lasting damage has been caused to the landlord by the breach, the proportionality between any damage to the landlord and the benefit to the landlord if relief is refused, hardship caused to the tenant if relief is refused, and whether third party rights have intervened and the circumstances in which they have done so. By way of an example of lasting damage caused to a landlord by a tenant's breach, in the Hoffman and Feinberg decision, the court refused relief where it was found that the property had been used for the purposes of illegal gambling. In the words of the court, the landlord had, been, had suffered lasting damage because of the slur which is involved in being said to be the landlord of a gaming house. As to the terms on which relief is ordered, the court in Egerton and Jones confirmed that the landlord is entitled to be put back in the position they would have been in had there been no forfeiture. Turning then to costs, what about costs? If the court orders relief under section 146, the lessor is entitled to their costs under section 146.3. It is commonly a term of relief that the tenant pay the landlord's costs and that that be on the indemnity basis. This isn't automatic, however, and will depend on the particular circumstances of the case uh, the court is considering how the parties have conducted the litigation. But such a term was ordered in the Patel and K&J Restaurants Limited decision where the court stated, I have come to the conclusion that the indemnity basis should apply as a general principle that normally this should require that the applicant for relief should pay the landlord's costs on the indemnity basis rather than only on the standard basis. That decision is useful in that it clarifies and um, explains obiter comments made by the House of Lords in the Bilson decision where it was suggested that the indemnity basis was not the appropriate basis for costs. So I said at the outset we were considering other breach cases first, um, now moving to non-payment of rent cases. Section 146 does not apply in such cases and the law in this area is split in a number of ways or split into a number of subtopics. The first split is between um, the law relating to proceedings in the High Court and then proceedings in the County Court and then there is further division in the law uh, beyond that depending on the means adopted for effecting the forfeiture so that's whether it's peaceable re-entry or the service and issue issue and service of proceedings. So starting with the County Court where proceedings are the means of effecting forfeiture. The position here is governed by section 138 of the County Courts Act 1984, which provides for relief in what I consider to be four stages. I think some of the textbooks refer to there being three stages, um, but those stages of relief are before a trial or hearing, at a trial or hearing, after a trial or hearing but before possession is recovered, and then after possession is recovered. So to take each of these in turn before a trial or hearing, section, uh, subsection 2 of section 138 provides that if the lessee pays into court or to the lessor not less than five clear days before the return day, all the rent in arrear and the costs of the action, the tenant will obtain relief. However, it's important to note that pursuant to subsection 6, this does not apply where the lessor is proceeding in the same action to enforce a right of re-entry or forfeiture on any other ground in addition to non-payment of rent. That's the first stage. The second stage, at a trial or hearing, and this is subsection 3. This provides that if the action does not cease as a result of subsection 2 and the court at trial is satisfied that the lessor is entitled to enforce the right of re-entry or forfeiture, the court shall order possession of the land to be given to the lessor at the expiration of such period not being less than four weeks from the date of the order, as the court thinks fit, unless within that period, period the lessee pays into court or to the lessor all the rent in arrear and the costs of the action. It's worth noting here that 
possession orders in the subsection 3 form should be in the standard form N27. The third stage then is after trial or a hearing but before possession is recovered. Here the court can extend the time provided for in an order made under subsection 3 pursuant to subsection 4. The, the court may extend and the period specified um, at any time before possession is recovered. Pursuant to subsection 5 um, and, and then 7 as well, um, if the tenant pays all the arrears and costs in the time specified in the order, the lease will continue. If the tenant does not pay the arrears and costs within that time, the tenant will be barred from all relief, and that's subsection 7. However, that does not include the ability to apply under subsection 4 to extend time for compliance with the possession order. Subsection 9 provides that where time is extended under subsection 4, after the time provided for in, in whatever order, and after a time that a warrant for possession has been issued and the court decides to extend time, it will also extend time for that warrant of possession. Finally, the last stage is that um, where the landlord recovers possession, the tenant has six months from the date on which the, the landlord recovers possession to apply for relief, and that's subsection 9a. And the important point to note there is that um, that relief is discretionary. So in the other, at the other stages of um, section 138, the relief is automatic. Under subsection 9a, um, the wording is that the court may grant such relief as it thinks fit. Moving then to um, the county, county court proceedings, but where forfeiture has been exercised by means of peaceable re-entry, the position here is governed by section 139.2 of the County Courts Act 1984, and that provides that, in short, the lessee, uh, the, the tenant, has uh, six months from the date of re-entry to apply to the county court for relief, and on such an application, the court will apply um, and grant such relief as the High Court could have granted. So what we're looking at, even though it's a county court application, are the principles of um, uh, the equitable inherent jurisdiction of the High Court. So that provides a nice segue onto um, the High Court principles. So starting with the High Court um, or High Court proceedings relating to uh, forfeiture exercised by means of proceedings. Several statutes are relevant here, the first of which is the Senior Courts Act 1981, and in particular Section 38.1, and that provides that in any, in any action in the High Court for the forfeiture of a lease for non-payment of rent, the Court shall have power to grant relief against forfeiture in a summary manner and may do so subject to the same terms and conditions as to the payment of rent, costs or otherwise, as could have been imposed by it in such an action immediately before the commencement of this Act. Now the important point here is that relief in the High Court is discretionary. However, invariably the tenant will only obtain relief on terms that the unpaid rent and costs are paid. And this is seen in the decision in Entrepreneur Pub Company and Langton, where the following was stated by the court about the High Court's jurisdiction to grant relief under Section 38.1. In what circumstances is relief given? The right to forfeit the lease is regarded in equity merely as security for the covenant to pay rent. Accordingly, the courts of equity commonly granted relief where judgment for possession was obtained but the tenant subsequently paid the rent and other expenses of the landlord and it was just and equitable to grant relief. The tenant had to pay other expenses of the landlord in order to put the landlord in the same position as he would have been if there had been no forfeiture of the lease. So the, the take home point there is that it's discretionary, albeit subject to payment of rent costs and all other things being equitable um, to grant relief. In addition to Section 38.1 of the Senior Courts Act 1981, we also need to consider the Common Law Procedure Act uh, of 1852. Two provisions are key from this. The first is Section 212, which is of similar effect to Section 138.2 of the County Courts Act, in that it provides that if the tenant at any time before the trial 
pay the landlord or pay into, the, pay into court all the rent and the costs, then the proceedings shall cease and be discontinued. So it's a similar pre-trial um, provision. The second provision of note is section 210, which is very long and impenetrably drafted, but its effect is that where the landlord is seeking forfeiture by proceedings, the tenant has six months from recovery of possession by the landlord to seek relief. Now, an, an important point to note in respect of both of these provisions is that there must be six months of rent in arrears for the provisions to apply. That then is the position in the High Court where the means of effecting forfeiture is the issue and service of proceedings. Turning then to proceedings in the High Court where the means of effecting forfeiture is peaceable re-entry. Here we are concerned with the High Court's inherent equitable jurisdiction. Section 38 does not apply, the Common Law Procedure Act does not apply, and we are left with uh, the inherent jurisdiction and, in terms of time limits, whether or not the tenant has sought relief with reasonable promptitude. The six-month time limit does not apply, um, but is a guide in these sorts of cases. Now, the, the law in this area was um, recently reviewed by the Court of Appeal in Keshwala and Balsod, and is a very useful decision in that it goes through these principles. So I would, I would recommend, if you're looking at this area, taking a look at that case. In this case, the tenant applied for relief under Section 139.2 of the County Courts Act, but towards the end of the six-month period from when the landlord had re-entered. Just before the tenant applied for relief, the landlord had granted a new tenancy to a third party. The court ultimately refused the tenant relief because it was held that the tenant had not acted with reasonable promptitude, albeit it had acted within the six-month deadline provided for in section 139.2. Now just to emphasise again, this is a section 139.2 county court case, but it requires consideration of the equitable jurisdiction of the High Court. Paragraph 64 to 66 of this decision are particularly useful and they, although the court in those paragraphs um, said as follows, if a landlord has forfeited for non-payment of rent and taken possession by peaceable re-entry, the grant of relief is always discretionary, either in the county court because of the, the express terms of section 139.2 or in the high court because it is exercising an equitable jurisdiction. In the county court, the application must be brought within six months. In the high court, there is no strict time limit, but the court will have regard to the six months. The discretion is to be exercised in both courts in accordance with equitable principles, including the well-established principle that equity regards the right of re-entry as security for the payment of the rent. And other things being equal, the court will ordinarily grant relief if the tenant pays all that is due in terms of rent and costs. If therefore all that has happened is that the landlord has taken possession and then done nothing with the premises, simply sitting back to see what happens, the mere fact that the tenant has delayed is unlikely to be regarded as sufficient by itself to cause the court to refuse relief. But that does not mean that so long as the tenant brings his application before the end of six months, he will be treated as having acted with reasonable promptitude or that his delay will always be regarded as immaterial. The longer the tenant leaves it, the more likely it is he will find that the court will conclude that he's failed to act with reasonable promptitude and the more likely it will be that intervening events will make it inequitable to grant relief. If the landlord, acting reasonably and not precipitately, has altered his position, it may be unjust to grant relief, as also it may be if the rights of third parties have intervened. Finally, I refer to the decision in Pineport and Grange Glen Limited, where the tenant applied for relief some 14 months after the landlord had re-entered. This application was made in the High Court as an application in the County Court would have failed owing to the express time limit in section 139.2. Again, it was confirmed that the six-month time limit in section 210 is only a guide in such cases, and in the specific circumstances of that case, the tenant was found to have acted with reasonable promptitude. <laughs>
that concludes my canter through um, the law on relief from forfeiture. Thank you all very much for listening. Rebecca, there is one question that's uh, come in already, and that's in relation to um, where the Law Commission's going with <coughs> law of forfeiture, because whilst I'm sure we all think it's fit for purpose and crystal clear, um, there have been various proposals over the years. Is, is there any progress on that, is the question? Uh, good question. Um, the answer to that is unfortunately not. There's been no indication from government that they intend to reform the law of forfeiture um, any time soon, even though they've got an oven-ready um, forfeiture bill, uh, which they, they may well, they could just take forward. Um, and I think they're even, you know, they're struggling clearly with even Section 21 and reform of that. So it seems fairly unlikely that anything's going to be coming forward in the near future. But should they wish to do so, um, in my view, there's a very good replacement regime waiting for to be discovered. <laughs> We shall see. Mm. I think they've reported on it three times, four times, and well, nothing's yes, over the, decades, and nothing's exactly. happened. The first report, I think, was in the 60s. So, um, yeah. like the law of forfeiture, its story of reform is also quite ancient. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. Um, I don't think there's any questions in the room. Please do put your hand up if you do. Just yeah, just, just just one second. We just hand you a microphone. So, always the people online. Okay. Perfect. I, I just wonder if any of the panel have ever come across a case where a a tenant has successfully argued that the rent it should, the rent arrears that it should pay to get relief against forfeiture should only be the last quarter or the last month's uh, rent, which is the technical trigger for the forfeiture, as opposed to paying maybe the previous two or three quarters months or um, sorry quarters or months arrears, which have accrued prior to the landlord deciding to forfeit. Um, I think Thomas and Ken Thomas says you can't get as a condition for relief, any rent that you've waived the right to forfeit for. So your example would be, would work if for quarters one and two there'd been a waiver and for quarter three you hadn't waived and that was your basis for forfeiting. Um, otherwise, all the rent that's in arrear would have to be a condition of relief. Hmm. Anyone else on the panel who thinks I'm wrong can correct me though. No, I mean, yeah. I was just going to add to that. Thomas and Ken Thomas is one of the least known cases, but as far as I can work brilliant. out, and has never ever been used against you. And I'm acting for a landlord, but it's a brilliant, uh, it's a brilliant authority if you're acting for the tenant. Also good on appropriation, Thomas yeah. and Ken Thomas. So if a landlord gets paid some money in respect of rent, what it can allocate that rent to. Basically, if the tenant makes a choice, it has to be allocated to the rent the tenant has chosen that it should be allocated to. But otherwise, the the landlord has free reign. So allocate it to the oldest payments and then you can keep your right to forfeit for the more recent ones. Yeah. Thank you. Great, great question. And all look up Thomas and Ken Thomas <laughs> if you're acting for tenants. Um, We've got a few online questions. Let me uh, pick one. Um, uh, it's from Lynn. Does a periodic tenancy that arises at the end of a lease when the tenant holds over and pays rent have implied into it the forfeiture clause that was contained in the original lease? So who wants to take that? Do you want to take it, Rebecca? I think that's yeah. your section. It is indeed. Um, yeah, short answer to that, which is yes. And a happy answer as well, because I think if the answer were no, then if a landlord allowed a tenant uh, a tenancy to run beyond the end of its term, then there would be a very real risk that it wouldn't be able to forfeit. Yep. Um, from someone else, how does the Greenwich and discrete selling case interact with residential forfeiture where a final determination of service charges and rent is needed before the landlord can forfeit? Can that determination only be one of the FTT in a Section 27A claim or will a default judgment in the county court suffice? Does anyone want to take that? Uh, well, I had, a, I had a brief read of Greenwich and discrete selling on my phone on Westlaw just a moment ago. Excellent. I hadn't, I hadn't <laughs> heard of it before. Um, and that is a as far as I understand it, a commercial uh, commercial case, albeit there were some flats above and there were breaches of repair that were complained of, and this, in the schedule that was attached to the Section 146 notice 
was described as an interim schedule. Now, from my reading on my phone of the case, um, the landlord had reserved its rights in respect of other defects, but the court said in that case, those weren't the grounds for forfeiture. So the fact that it was labelled an interim schedule um, was immaterial for the purposes of the Section 146 notice. I'm not really sure that has any impact on Section 168. Um, firstly, predates, but also there's a specific statutory regime that says you have to have a determination of the breach or an admission of it. Um, in terms of whether that determination needs to be by the FTT or the county court, well, it doesn't have to be by the FTT. The legislation says it can be by the court, the tribunal, and just on the tribunal, that would be the LVT in Wales, or by an arbitral tribunal. Um, the landlord has the power to apply to the FTT or the LVT under section 168 subsection 4, um, although it can't do so if there has already been, for example, a determination by the court. So a default judgment would, in my mind, amply satisfy that. Yeah, that question of whether default judgment suffices just sort of rumbles on generally, I think. Um, question from Claire. Will acceptance, this might be for you again, Evie, will acceptance of rent once a Section 146 notice has been served but the time frame for remedy hasn't yet passed constitute a waiver? No. Is, that, is the question, if there's been a breach? So acceptance of rent, so Section 146 notice has been served but the time frame for remedy hasn't passed. If you accept rent after you serve the notice, oh. but before the time you've given them to remedy at the reasonable time to remedy has passed, is that going to constitute a... Yes, it would constitute a waiver, yes. Unless it's a continuing breach. Unless it's a continuing breach, but then you'd have to serve a section, another section 146 notice, wouldn't you? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I feel uh, like I'm in. I feel like I'm in a test. <laughs> <laughs> but you did set a quiz. <laughs> yeah. When should forfeiture proceedings be brought in the High Court as opposed to the County Court? Any takers? Well, if there are complexities of law, yeah. or specific public importance points, or p particular complexities of fact, basically, probably shouldn't really be bringing it in the High Court. Although. Maybe it, it's worth thinking about it a little bit more flexibly than Practice Direction 55A suggests because you, you might not get knocked down to the county court and you might get a quicker and smoother. Mm. I, I, that's, it that's is probably, a firm warning in yeah, yeah. Practice Direction not to do it, but there are cases where it's suitable, yeah. And, and I think, anecdotally at least, more recently the High Court hasn't been pushing as much stuff down. Yeah. And presumably, Peter, uh, if we turn that question around, and it also relates to when should you seek relief in the High Court as opposed to the County Court, there's many more cases where you might want to do that because it's your only option. Yes. Is so that right? Pineport, um, the last case I referred to, was an example of that. Um, a relief couldn't have been sought in the County Court because of the six-month time limit. If you're applying outside of six months as a tenant for relief, then you're probably limited to seeking that in the High Court. Any others in the room? There's plenty more online, but I don't want to stop people in the room from putting their hands up. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, just one, it wasn't touched on in the talk about getting consent of administrators um, when you're doing forfeiture. Has anyone got any experience or any top tips, given that's the way everything's going at the moment? Mm -hmm. um, that is a talk in itself. <laughs> um, top tips. Are you thinking about it in specific in relation to waiver? Um, and I don't, I don't that, I don't know any, of any cases where that, that's been run. But I can see how that can be a problem, and you have to be very careful about accepting rent. Um, I'm, I'm struggling now to think of top tips. Um, can I come back to you on that one? Because yeah, yeah, that is that is a very large topic in itself, and it will, I'm sure it will become a, a an area of of litigation in the next few years that booms. Um, Does it depend on who the administrator is? Well, whether you're going to get consent or not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you basically have to move really quickly on, on them. I mean, in part, it's about, it's about how the landlord optically looks. Is the landlord sitting by and accepting benefits from the administrators while 
um, while they like see how things go or have you you, you know jump quite quickly basically yeah. but it all turns on the specific purpose and what your um what what rights are being infringed who's going to stand to benefit and who's going to stand to lose from the court giving permission or not giving permission to forfeit all right i think we're we're, we're nearly out of time I, I've, but i've picked two more um if you're serving a section 20 if service of a section 20 notice so this is in a residential context where the section 20 notice is consulting on proposed you know major works or whatever so if serving a section 20 notice can be tantamount to waiving a right to forfeit should an application for dispensation be made instead to protect the landlord's position or could that be seen as risking waiver as well i think it could be seen as risking waiver as well why not because you are relying on your rights under the lease. I, I mean, I just, I find STEMP to be totally unprincipled. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really difficult. There's so many, mm. so many traps landlords can fall into with residential long leases. Uh, final question. Can we find out which is true, the hamsters or Emma Watson? <laughs> do, you, do you want to take that, Rebecca? I think it's Emma Watson's true and the hamsters, hamsters are not. That is exactly right, yeah. yes. I don't know what, if I have the air of a hamster breeder about me, and but um, that is not that Indeed, is not true. Peter did not win stage 13 in the Tour de France, as far as I'm aware, and I can't vouch for whether Evie is a good singer or not, but I'm fairly confident she didn't do three nights at the Royal Albert Hall. Um, those of you online, thank you very much for uh, joining us, and we're going to bring matters to a close. And for those of you in the room, if we can just thank our speakers in the usual way.